Okay, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. This is Kathleen Otero, Deputy Director of the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, welcoming you today on our webinar session. So today's session, Medication Assisted Treatment Series, Part 2 of 2, Medication Assisted Treatment During Pregnancy, Postnatal, and Beyond. And again, this is Kathleen Otero, and we are um, happy to have Carol Kaufenbach here with us uh, presenting. To quickly review our agenda for today, we are currently doing just a couple little introductory remarks. And then we will move into the bulk of the presentation, medication-assisted treatment during pregnancy, postnatal, and beyond. We'll touch a little bit on considerations for child welfare policy and practice. And again, if we don't get a chance to answer any questions during the course of the presentation itself, then we have some time slotted at the end for some discussion and, and questions and answers. Um, you may notice that your lines are muted, so um, you will not be able to ask questions verbally to the presenter, but again, feel free to ask any questions at any point using the question and answer dialog box on your um, right-hand side control panel. Quick message from our sponsors. The National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, the Children's Bureau Office on Child Abuse and Neglect. And our mission is to improve outcomes for families affected by substance abuse who are involved in the child welfare and family court system. Just a quick touch on who's joining us today. We always think it's uh, interesting to find out who's participating. And of the registrants that we have uh, for today's session, about almost half are substance abuse treatment providers. About a third of you are child welfare workers. Uh, about a 25% of you indicated that you were from another system. And then we have about 6% who are from um, child welfare, uh, I'm sorry, dependency courts or family drug courts. Most of you, about 88%, um, indicated that you attended part one, understanding uh, medication assisted treatment for families affected by substance use disorders, the presentation that we did in July. And if you did not attend the first session, again, you can check out our Children and Family Futures website for the materials and handouts from that first session. A quick review uh, from part one of understanding sub, um, MAP for families affected by substance use disorders. A couple of issues that we touched upon um, included medical marijuana, prescription medication misuse and abuse, um, MAP for co-occurring mental health disorders and for substance use disorders. We um, talked about the use of MAP as exclusionary criteria for child welfare programs, particularly family drug courts misunderstanding the use of medication-assisted treatment, treatment, particularly methadone treatment in substance abuse treatment and how it relates to child protection and child safety. And in particular, on the agenda for today and what Dr. Kaltenbach will present is um, some, uh, addressing some of the issues that came up last time on the requirement of minimal dosing or titrating off of medication-assisted treatment medications for pregnant women or as a term for reunification as well as um, the issue of positive toxicology resulting in a presumptive cause for child, child removal in the case of methadone. And so without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Kaltenbach to um, take us through the presentation for today. Dr. Kaltenbach? Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you all today. This is very um, MAT, which again is medication-assisted treatment in pregnancy. I'm going to talk about that specifically as to what it involves, the medications that are used, and why we feel it's warranted and so important to be used. I'm also going to be talking about neonatal abstinence syndrome because that is uh, one of the issues that always comes up when you're talking about opioid dependence during pregnancy, um, specific to um, the opioids, the illicit drugs that are used, and the maintenance medications that are used. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about illicit drug use, uh, and by illicit drug use, it's exactly what it implies. It's illegal drugs. So uh, from that, we're talking about heroin, uh, cocaine, marijuana. Anything that is illegal is what comes under the terminology of illicit drug use. And prescription misuse, again, uh, is what the title implies. It's prescription medication that is legal to use and that is an important medication but that has been either misused or is being abused. And uh, for this topic, what we're usually talking about are medications such as Percocet, Oxycontin, uh, where they are being abused and the women have become dependent upon them. Uh, we're also uh, talking about benzodiazepines, uh, which is a very highly prescribed medication uh, and but is also uh, very much used and abused within this population. 
Then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about co-occurring psychiatric disorders. What do you do about treatment, providing treatment to opioid-dependent pregnant women who also suffer from a number of psychiatric disorders? And then we will spend a little bit of time talking about breastfeeding because that's always an issue that comes to the forefront uh, in this population. I want to just emphasize the term MAP. Um, you see that throughout all the titles, medication-assisted treatment. And it's, our language is very, very important. It used to be um, when we give a talk about opioid dependence during pregnancy, you talk about methadone maintenance treatment program. Um, and that nomenclature has been changed to medication-assisted treatment, and for two reasons. Uh, one is now we have another medication. We have methadone and we have buprenorphine, and I'll be speaking about both of those. But also to emphasize that this is medication-assisted treatment. We're talking about treatment for substance abuse disorders, in particular opioid dependence, and we're talking about a medication. We're not talking about misuse of a drug. Sometimes you'll see um, even posters at scientific presentations where they'll identify drugs and they'll call them illicit and they'll have methadone on it. Well, methadone is a medication. It's been defined by the American Disabilities Act as a life-sustaining medication. Uh, it's used for a number of things other than just uh, treatment of opioid dependence. And certainly buprenorphine is another one of those medications. So it's very important that you understand the underlying principles. We're talking about treatment for substance abuse disorders, and by that term I mean the full complement of treatment, comprehensive services. We won't have enough time to discuss um, the array of services that are necessary for this uh, population, but we're talking about extensive treatment services in conjunction with pharmacotherapy, medication. So I just want to make that point because that lays the groundwork for uh, the rest of the, the talk. So to talk about medication-assisted treatment, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about um, methadone and buprenorphine. Um, but methadone has a very long history in the United States. Uh, it has been recommended for the uh, management of opioid dependence during pregnancy since the early 1970s. It was approved for use in this country in the late 1960s. So we have a very long history of using methadone. Uh, another important thing to understand is that in 1997, the NIH Consensus Panel, the National Institute of Health, had a consensus panel uh, that was to identify and look at treatment for opioid dependence. And in that consensus panel, methadone was recommended as the standard of care for pregnant women. Uh, and that imprimatur is very important. If you go back to uh, the two things that were uh, talked about, the issues that we're going to talk about, the requirement of minimal, quote, dosing of medications for pregnant women as a term for reunification, uh, and the talking about uh, the presence of a positive toxicology as a presumptive cause for child removal. That's inconsistent with the idea that methadone or the fact that methadone is a medication that's recommended by the NIH as a standard of care. Um, so we're going to talk about that and hopefully explain why it has that recommendation and why the idea of, of uh, requiring minimal dosing um, or not allowing reunification with a parent who is receiving, who is successfully receiving methadone treatment uh, is uh, inconsistent. Buprenorphine is the new um, kid on the block. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time, even though it's very new in the United States. It's been used in Europe since the mid-1990s, um, so we have a long history of its use with pregnant women. Uh, in the United States, it's not yet formally approved for use with pregnant patients, but its use in the USA is increasing. Uh, we have a large uh, number of women who are uh, being maintained on buprenorphine before they become pregnant, and then once they become pregnant, they choose to remain on buprenorphine. We also have an increasing number of women who um, are being inducted onto buprenorphine uh, during pregnancy. They are naive to treatment, and they choose buprenorphine over methadone. So we're going to talk about both of those issues. So, oops, I've got to go back. Then my arrow's on here. 
little causing me some problems. Just a second. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the med the benefits of using medication assisted treatment during pregnancy, and they have some very very strong benefits. When a woman is opioid dependent and she's using illicit drugs, heroin, or even um, prescription drugs like Percocet or uh, Percocet. Those are short-acting opioids, so they only have an effect for a short amount of time. They wear off after four to six hours, um, and so if she doesn't have an another uh, dose to take right away, another shot of heroin to take right away, she's going to start going through withdrawal. And every time the mother goes through withdrawal, the fetus goes through withdrawal. And it's those episodic episodes of withdrawal, repeated episodes of withdrawal that are so damaging to the fetus. Um, every, that's when you're talking about um, fetal morbidity and mortality. Most of the time that's a result of these repeated episodes of withdrawal. Now we're also going to be talking about the withdrawal that occurs when the infant is born and there's a lot of focus on that. But we also need to remember that um, we need to be cautious about the fetus going through withdrawal. And when you have a woman uh, on methadone maintenance or on buprenorphine maintenance, you're going to stabilize her. And so she's not going to have um, the erratic repeated episodes. And so you're going to have a very stable interuterine environment for that fetus. Even though it's being exposed to an opioid, it's protecting it from more harmful effects of these repeated episodes of withdrawal. So that's the primary reason why um, medication-assisted treatment during pregnancy is considered uh, the standard of care. When we're talking about effective maintenance, and this is where we're going to get into the issue of uh, minimizing dose, effective maintenance or a therapeutic maintenance, um, you pre prevent the onset of withdrawal for at least 24 hours. So if she can get medicated every day, she's never going to go into withdrawal. Um, she comes in every day or she has take-home medication depending upon her length and treatment and depending upon what medication she's on, but you're going to stabilize her so that she never goes through withdrawal. If she's on an effective dose, a therapeutic dose, you're also going to reduce or eliminate drug cravings, so she's not going to want to seek the, the drug that she's dependent on, and it's going to block the euphoric effects of other opioids, other narcotics, so she's not going to continue to use. So that's what it takes to have an effective dose. And if you give someone, a pregnant woman, a low dose that's not really an effective dose, you're probably going to prevent the onset of withdrawal, but you're not going to reduce or eliminate the drug craving, and you're not going to block the euphoric effect. So in all probability, she's going to continue to use, and I'm just going to use heroin as an example, she's going to continue to use heroin even though she's in a treatment program and receiving, and I'm going to use methadone as an example, because it's not an effective dose. It's not a therapeutic dose. Remember, again, this is a medication. We have to use the same principles that we use for any medication that we're taking for any kind of illness or disease. So we do have to have, make sure that women are on effective doses. Okay, so back to now the benefits. As I said, it prevents the erratic uh, fetus from repeated episodes of withdrawal. You also have indirect effects because the only way a woman can receive maintenance medication is either through an opioid treatment program if she's receiving methadone or through a physician's office if she's receiving buprenorphine or also through an opioid treatment program. So she's engaged in a broader range of treatment. You get her, she's engaged in treatment so you're going to reduce the risk to the fetus of infection from HIV, from hepatitis and sexually transmitted disease because you're reducing those risk behaviors in the mother. Uh, you're also going to reduce the incidence of obstetrical and fetal complications for two reasons. Number one, you've stabilized that inner uterine environment so that you don't have the repeated episodes of withdrawal. And number two, she's getting prenatal care. If she's coming in, if she's enrolled in a uh, opioid treatment program, they're going to either provide the pre uh, prenatal care or they're going to coordinate it. That's one of the criteria of accreditation in the United States, uh, that for any pregnant woman enrolled in an opioid treatment program, 
you must either directly provide or coordinate prenatal care. Uh, and certainly if she's receiving buprenorphine from an office-based physician, uh, he's also going to make sure that she has the appropriate referrals and that she's receiving the necessary care. So then I want to talk a little bit about withdrawal procedures because this is also a question that always comes up. Um, people that are interested in uh, not having women uh, maintained on medication, uh, people, women that may be maintained on medication but who decide that they don't want to be during their pregnancy. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why the question of withdrawal procedures come up during pregnancy, so we need to talk a little bit about them and make sure that we understand both the procedures, what we have to do if we're going to utilize them, and what the risks are. So we're really talking about two terminologies. When we talk about medication-assisted withdrawal, that's what's used to provide transition from an illicit opioid to a drug-free strain. So if you have a woman who's um, abusing heroin, she's dependent on heroin, uh, and she wants to um, go into treatment. She doesn't want methadone maintenance, uh, but she certainly doesn't want to go through uh, withdrawal uh, in the classical cold turkey kind of uh, paradigm uh, by just stop using heroin. So uh, methadone or buprenorphine may be provided to transition her from that illicit drug use to a drug-free state so she doesn't have to go through withdrawal. Then the other terminology that we use is a taper, and that's for someone that is receiving maintenance, who's been enrolled in a maintenance program, uh, and who wants to transition from maintenance to a drug-free state. And so uh, that's, that's what we refer to when we're talking about a taper. So those are two very um, different kinds of situations explored. So if you have medication-assisted withdrawal, if a woman comes in uh, and she said, I'm you know, using heroin, I'm pregnant, I don't want uh, any kind of maintenance, um, so please help me uh, go through withdrawal. You need to provide counseling and education on the risks and benefits of maintenance. Obviously, it's the woman's choice. She has uh, a free choice in this matter, and her, her wishes need to be respected. But we also need to ensure that she has uh, adequate information to make an informed decision. So she needs to be provided counseling and education on the risks and benefits of maintenance. On uh, Certainly it's um, you know, admirable to want to um, maintain an abstinent state, but she needs to understand um, what the probability of that is and what the risks are to her fetus if she's not able to do that. Um, the same way with a taper, when a woman is already receiving uh, maintenance uh, and requests a taper, um, sometimes it may be a personal request, sometimes it may be because she's moving to an area where um, she's not going to have access to uh, a methadone maintenance program, although with buprenorphine um, she can uh, transition to, to buprenorphine uh, if necessary. Um, but a taper is when she is in a program and wants to uh, taper off the medication. Again, a thorough assessment is essential to determine if the woman is an appropriate candidate. Um, some women uh, may not really want to do this, but they're under pressure from their families. Um, oftentimes the families do not understand what medication-assisted treatment is. Um, they see it as simply an extension of the drug use. Uh, again, this comes back to some of our terminology uh, where we talk about substitution treatment. This is not substitution treatment. We're not substituting one illegal drug for another. We're providing medication in order to assist the woman to get to a state of recovery. Um, so oftentimes she's under severe pressure. Oftentimes she's under pressure from uh, Department of Health and Human Services also uh, that um, you know, if you can't be receiving methadone, uh, that's not seen as a positive in order for her to uh, keep her children, so she may be under pressure there to, uh, to taper. But you need to have a thorough assessment to determine if she's an appropriate candidate, uh, because motivation is not always just the only criteria. And it needs to be conducted under supervision by a physician uh, that's accompanied by fetal monitoring because 
withdrawal can be a threat to the fetus. So it needs to be done very carefully uh, and uh, under uh, the supervision of a physician. There's always been um, recommendations going back to treatment being uh, initiated with this population in the 70s. Uh, the recommendation has always been that if withdrawal is necessary, it should only be conducted during the second trimester, first trimester, uh, because you may um, cause uh, spontaneous abortion, and you don't ever want to do it during the third trimester because you may precipitate um, uh, delivery uh, and prematurity. Um, that's been the clinical standard, and if you go back and, and read any of the publications, uh, even up to today, you know recommends that withdrawal be conducted during the, the second trimester. Um, you need to know that there are no systematic studies on whether withdrawal should only be initiated during this time. Uh, there certainly is some uh, evidence that uh, the rates of spontaneous abortion and prematurity do not differ from rates in the general population uh, among women that have gone through withdrawal. Um, so most people would not question as to whether it can be done safely or not. Um, again, as I said, if it's done very carefully, uh, if the patient is in an outpatient program um, and so you have methadone, you want to decrease the methadone very slowly by two to two and a half milligrams a week. If the woman is inpatient, it can be done more rapidly uh, to two, two to two and a half milligrams a day. Um, but again, fetal movement must be monitored and non-stress tests performed, and it should be discontinued if it causes fetal stress or threatens to cause premature labor. And I've included a reference here. This is um, a citation from the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, which is their um, tip on medication-assisted treatment. TIP is a treatment improvement protocol uh, publication that they put out that's developed by a consensus panel that gives you guidelines on standard of care. So we know that women can safely be withdrawn during pregnancy. The question is whether it should be done. So it's not an issue of whether it can, but it's an issue of whether it should. And the reason it's an issue of whether it should is because despite an individual's good intentions, um, there's a very high rate of relapse in opioid-dependent women uh, during pregnancy. And any time you have a relapse, you're going to put uh, the fetus at additional risk. And again, we're looking for both uh, to improve the health of the mother and also to ensure that we have a healthy, full-term baby uh, born from this pregnancy. And that's what the goal of any uh, reception of medication-assisted treatment is, to ensure that we have the healthiest baby possible. So I just want to quickly give you some data that sort of um, speaks to this. This was a, a study that was done um, at Johns Hopkins. It was published in 2008. Um, it's not a randomized study or anything like that. It was simply looking at available data that they had. It was a retros retrospective study of maternal and neonatal consequences of withdrawal during pregnancy. And they had a natural kind of experimental design because they had a specialized program for pregnant women, um, opioid-dependent pregnant women, or non-opioid but substance using women, but they could come into their program and they did provide methadone for opioid dependent women. And they also provided medication assisted withdrawal if the woman did not want maintenance. So they had, and then over the course of a number of years, they changed their protocol from a three day withdrawal, which is a very quick withdrawal, to a seven day withdrawal. Um, so they could compare the, the quicker versus the longer withdrawal also. So it was a very uh, interesting naturalistic experiment. So they had a group of women who um, came in and requested withdrawal, got withdrawal, and never went to maintenance. Then they had a comparison group that was the same type of women that requested withdrawal, but eventually decided that this was not for them, that they wanted maintenance, so they went on to methadone maintenance. Um, and then they had the same kind of comparison between the seven-day withdrawal, and then they had the um, ultimate comparison group of women who received methadone maintenance from treatment entry who never had a medication-assisted withdrawal. 
And what they found was, without going through all of the, the different results, was that um, for women that were maintained, if they did not, and this is for both the women who never had withdrawal or the women who had withdrawal but went into maintenance, but any woman who was receiving maintenance treatment, they remained in treatment much longer. They attended more prenatal care appointments, which we know is critically important in terms of the outcome of the infant. And they delivered at the program hospital. <coughs> and you say, well, what difference does it make what hospital they deliver at? But it's extremely important that when you have a pregnant opioid-dependent woman, uh, that she's delivering at a hospital that knows her if she's been maintained. They need to, to know her so that they know to observe the infant uh, and be prepared for the abstinence that may, uh, the infant may undergo. Um, so this becomes also an important factor in terms of improving outcomes. But certainly the treatment retention, we have lots of data that shows that this is one of the most important variables in good outcomes. And obviously, prenatal care is the primary factor. So the maintenance groups did much, much better than the women who went through medical withdrawal. So obviously, no one is going to dispute that the infant, the delivery of uh, infant free of drug exposure, exposure is a universal goal. That's all of our goals, when possible. But in the case of opioid dependence, this must be balanced within the risk benefits of continued medication. And this is something that is going to be the driving force between throughout um, our treatment of women, both in terms of initiating uh, medication assisted during treatment and in terms of the outcome of the infants, is looking at the risk benefits of using medication as opposed to not using medication. So I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the induction to methadone maintenance so that people are familiar with it, even though you won't necessarily be doing it. Um, if you are providing services to this population, you need to at least be familiar with it to know what is required and what has to be um, undergone. So in terms of methadone, um, you need to be aware that uh, it is governed by very, very strict regulatory issues. Um, not everybody can be uh, maintained on methadone. Uh, you have to have a documented opioid dependence for a minimum of one year. Uh, you also need to know that pregnant women are exempt from that. And again, that comes back to the reason that uh, it seems so important to be able to stabilize that inner uterine environment. So they don't have to have a year of dependence, but they, you have to be able to document and certify that they're pregnant if they don't meet um, the legal requirements. The first dose is restricted to either 30 milligrams or less. You can never give someone more than 30 milligrams for the first dose, whether they're in the hospital or not. Um, if you give them uh, a 30 milligram dose and their withdrawal symptoms persist after two to four hours, uh, the initial dose can be supplemented with another five to 10 milligrams. But the maximum first day total dose can only be 40 milligrams. It may not exceed 40 milligrams unless it's documented by a physician that that dose was insufficient to control withdrawal. Um, so these are the way the regs read in terms of the practical application. Um, I don't know of anybody who would go over 40 milligrams in an outpatient setting. Uh, certainly when you have a person inpatient in the hospital and she's being monitored very closely and carefully, you can go higher in the first day if the physician feels that it's warranted. Um, that being said, one of the problems with induction is that people do not understand the pharmacology of methadone. Uh, <clears throat> and its half-life is um, 24 hours, which means it takes that long in order for um, half of the medication to leave the body. So if you give a dose and then two or three hours give another dose, you've got a large accumulation building up in the blood uh, stream uh, that's not being excreted. So you have to be very careful. It takes about six to seven days with methadone in order to achieve a steady state, which means that um, it's a steady level between what they're taking and what stays in the bloodstream. So um, you have to be very, very cautious during induction. Uh, and you know, the rule of thumb is take it low and slow. Certainly the major difference in outpatient and hospital induction 
is that inpatient allows for medical monitoring and a much more comprehensive approach. The outpatient, though, is often a practical necessity because uh, not a lot of programs have the ability to uh, have an inpatient hospital induction. Uh, so if it is done on an outpatient basis, you need to have twice daily observation uh, until the patient is stabilized. Again, because she takes the medication, that medication is not going to peak until about four to five hours. That's when she's going to feel uh, the most of it, and then it's going to start to taper off uh, and decrease over the next 24-hour um, period. So she needs to be observed. In terms of methadone, the two areas that um, seem to raise the most concern are effective dose and the relationship of dose to neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, but dose should always be used on a, with the same criteria that is used for non-pregnant patients. There should never, ever be a different dose regimen for pregnant patients as opposed to non-pregnant patients. The same criteria that for a therapeutic dose, that you're trying to prevent the onset of withdrawal, you're trying to reduce or eliminate drug craving and block the euphoric effects, has to be used so that they should be on the same type of dose as any other person. Um, optimal dose, it used to be that was suggested it was in the range of 80 to 120 milligrams. This work was done back in the 60s. Uh, when heroin was not very pure, the heroin on the street was only about 10% pure. Uh, now the heroin on the street is about 80% pure. So the current data indicates that most patients are maintained on doses between 100 to 200 milligrams. You need to know that others may require significantly higher doses. Uh, and you also need to be very cautious and know what other medications they are taking because some medications interfere with the metabolism of methadone, either speeding it up or lowering it. Uh, and um, some medications, such as benzodiazepines, can have a fatal interaction. So you have to be very cautious about what other medications that they are taking. If you have a, an opioid-dependent woman who uh, became pregnant while receiving methadone, she should be maintained on her pre-pregnant pregnancy dose. There should be no changes simply because she has now become uh, pregnant. There's also continued debate regarding the relationship between maternal dose and neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why there has been, even though this has been the standard of care for almost 40 years, why there tends to be continued resistance to the use of methadone because the infant will go through abstinence, uh, and there has been a feeling that the higher the dose, the worse the abstinence. Uh, the data for this is inconsistent. Uh, there's about 33 studies to date. The majority of them show that there is no relationship between maternal uh, methadone dose and the severity of abstinence. There's a lot of factors that go into the severity of abstinence in addition to the medication, uh, the genetic host, the metabolism system of the infant, the, the gestational age of the infant, there's many, many things that go into it. And you can take a scatter plot and look at 100 women who are maintained on methadone. You can have a woman who's maintained on 40 milligrams and her infant has withdrawal that has to be treated. You can have another woman who's maintained on 200 milligrams and her infant is discharged in four days because the withdrawal does not have to be treated. So you should never reduce maternal methadone dose to avoid NAS. Again, if you reduce it so that you're not giving a therapeutic dose, uh, you may promote supplemental drug use and increase risk to the fetus. So again, we come back to this risk benefit. Yes, the infant will go through withdrawal, but it's not, uh, it's not a, a direct linear relationship between the maternal dose and the, and the withdrawal. So you want to make sure that you can address all the other factors that put the fetus at risk. So you should never lower the maternal dose simply because you want to avoid withdrawal. Um, I want to talk about buprenorphine a little bit um, because it is uh, out there. A lot of people are using it. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, it was approved in 2002 by the um, 
Federal Drug Administration. It comes in two sublingual formulations. Uh, by sublingual, we mean it has pills that have to be placed under the tongue and they dissolve. Uh, one of those formulations is Subutex, which is buprenorphine, and Suboxone, which is buprenorphine plus naloxone. Uh, we are the, one of the few countries in the world that use Suboxone, and it's primarily only for, um, to reduce the diversion of buprenorphine. Uh, because, as you know, naloxone uh, is an antagonist, and if you are using opioids and you take naloxone, it will put you in withdrawal. It's what's used if you have an overdose of, of opioids. Um, but when it's taken sublingually, uh, mixed in this tablet, it has no effect on you, so that uh, you can take the medication uh, effectively. The naloxone has no effect unless you take the tablets and crush them up and try to inject them. And then the agonist will have an effect on you that will not be pleasant. So it's a diversionary control tactic, um, for the, and that's why we have Suboxone. Uh, and uh, that's the most widely prescribed prescription in the United States. Subutex is not used on an outpatient basis. The whole um, focus of the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000 which allows buprenorphine to be prescribed in physician offices uh, was to uh, improve access to treatment because we have many opioid dependent uh, patients who need medication assisted treatment who there simply are not available slots for. Um, so that uh, this is a schedule three medication uh, and this legislation uh, specifically stated that these schedule three, four, and five medications can be used um, for maintenance. Right now, buprenorphine is the only medication we have in that, in that category. Uh, methadone is a Schedule II medication, so the only way you can receive methadone for maintenance is, again, through a licensed and accredited opioid treatment program. In terms of pregnancy, the current guidelines recommend that buprenorphine be prescribed to pregnant women only when the benefits outweigh the risk and the patient has refused methadone. This, again, is the current guideline. Uh, but the reality is, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of pregnant women are being maintained on uh, buprenorphine. It's also recommended that if the woman chooses to be maintained on buprenorphine, that she be transitioned back to Subutex and not be maintained on Suboxone. But we also know that that is not happening, that if a woman is successfully maintained on Suboxone and wants to stay on it, that most of the time uh, she's continue to be maintained on that during her pregnancy. In terms of induction, the issue for buprenorphine uh, is dependence on short-acting opioids or long-acting opioids. If you're talking about someone using heroin or Oxycontin prescription uh, Percocet, those are short-acting opioids. So you have to have between 12 and 24 hours between the use of the drug that they're abusing they need to be exhibiting early signs of withdrawal before you give them buprenorphine administration because the buprenorphine will precipitate withdrawal. Um, Long-acting medications such as methadone, uh, it's more difficult to transition from methadone to buprenorphine. You have to taper the dose down to less than 30 milligrams for at least a week, uh, and you have to wait 24 hours from the last dose of methadone before you can administer buprenorphine. Uh, and they need to, the patients need to be, uh, it's uncomfortable, they need to be in withdrawal so that you don't precipitate withdrawal. So it's very difficult to go from methadone to buprenorphine. You can go from buprenorphine to methadone right away. She can take a dose of buprenorphine one day and a dose of methadone the next day. Um, we just went through this, go ahead. Um, buprenorphine also does not have the same regulatory restrictions as methadone. Uh, there's no regulatory restriction in terms of how much dose can be given initially and what the first day's dose can be. Typically, the first dose is 2 milligrams with the initial dose supplemented up to 4 milligrams. Uh, most patients are stabilized on 12 to 24 milligrams per day. Uh, but like methadone, it, it also takes a number of days to build up a steady state. But buprenorphine does not have the same um, depressive effects of methadone, so you don't have to be as concerned for um, causing respiratory distress if you um, 
provide it too much too quick. I want to talk about neonatal abstinence syndrome um, very quickly uh, because this is, again, what that the, uh, causes so much resistance to the use of treatment during pregnancy. Um, when we have uh, abstinence syndrome and maternal drug use, it's usually an opioid abstinence, you either from heroin, oxycodone, buprenorphine. There are other non-opioid drugs that can cause behaviors consistent with withdrawal, such as benzodiazepine, cocaine, alcohol, methamphetamine. Uh, but these, the last three that are asterisks usually do not require treatment, um, so we really don't talk about an abstinence syndrome. They just have uh, some symptomatology. Um, this is what we mean by the neonatal abstinence syndrome. The top picture shows an infant going to withdrawal. That's what neonatal abstinence is. The bottom picture shows an infant who is treated. So that any infant who is, whose mother has been using opioids, any infant whose mother has been maintained on methadone or buprenorphine will exhibit some withdrawal symptoms. Not all babies will have to be treated. Uh, the severity of withdrawal um, varies for, as I mentioned earlier, a number of reasons. Um, certainly it's very disconcerting to see an infant going through abstinence, uh, but it is a temporal phenomenon. If it's assessed and treated immediately, then you can see the infant is very comfortable, uh, and then you wean the infant gradually. Uh, there are no data that show any long-term sequelae from infants who have to be treated for abstinence. Um, and I just want to take a minute here also to um, discuss the difference between a baby going through withdrawal, being physically dependent on the drug, and being addicted. Oftentimes in the press, on the news stories, you see the term addicted baby used all the time. These babies are not addicted. Addiction is a psychiatric diagnosis that requires a lot of factors to be present in addition to being dependent on a drug. These babies are physically dependent on the drug because that's what opioids do. Um, the same way that alcohol, you become physically dependent on alcohol. You do not become physically dependent on cocaine. Uh, but the physical dependence means that when they are born uh, and they are no longer receiving any supply of it through uh, the uterus, they go through withdrawal but they are not addicted. We should not use that term. We should not refer to them as addicted babies because that's a very pejorative term. It sets up a whole host of expectations that are not, uh, realist, not appropriate. These are babies that are passively dependent on a drug that has crossed the placenta, uh, and they can be treated for it if the withdrawal is severe enough. So again, our language is very, very important. Um, the symptoms that you see are neurological excitability. These babies are very hyperactive. They're irritable. They have difficulty sleeping. They have difficulty eating. Uh, and um, they do, as I say, if the withdrawal is severe enough, then they're treated uh, with an opioid that they're gradually tapered off of. So the majority of infants exposed to opioids undergo withdrawal. Um, but the, as I said, they don't all need to be treated. The issue of severity and the need for pharmacal intervention is, is another issue. People tend to get um, very upset about infants having to be treated. Uh, again, it comes back to the risk-benefit. Um, uh, if a baby is born to a mother who uses heroin, who has not been maintained on methadone, uh, she that baby may have a very short uh, abstinence, may not have to be treated, but that baby has, uh, in all probability, will be born very early in gestation uh, and will have a number of problems associated with the morbidity of uh, withdrawal in the uterus. So again, it's a risk benefit. Would you rather have a full-term healthy newborn who has no other problems other than it's going to have dependence that has to be treated with a medication that can be done very successfully with no, un no sequelae from that, or a baby that's born very premature with all of the problems concomitant with prematurity. So again, those are the risks and benefits that have to be um, balanced. 
Um, I want to talk very briefly about the mother study because that's something that um, has made uh, the news. Um, this was a study that was conducted um, at eight sites throughout, the, six in the United States and one in Vienna, uh, one in Canada, where we were evaluating the possible differential impact of buprenorphine and methadone because we know that the withdrawal symptom uh, syndrome with methadone is much more severe than with heroin. Buprenorphine causes much less withdrawal in adults, so we we're assuming that it would cause less withdrawal um, in infants, and that's what this study was designed to evaluate. It's a, a randomized clinical trial. It's a very complex, uh, rigorous study. It was published in December in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, we certainly don't have time to go through the study, so I'm just going to give you the, the take-home message of what the findings for. We didn't find any difference in the number of infants that that had to be treated, whose withdrawal was severe enough for treatment between methadone and buprenorphine. Just as many buprenorphine babies had to be treated as methadone babies did. But among those infants that had to be treated, there was significant difference in the course of their abstinence. They required 89% less morphine to treat NAS. They spent 43% less time in the hospital and they spent 58 less time in the hospital being medicated for NAS. Both medications, be it buprenorphine or methadone, in the context of comprehensive care for the mother, produce similar maternal treatment and delivery outcomes. So the biggest uh, impact was on NAS. So I also need to um, just highlight for you that even though this was an extremely important study and has received a lot of attention. It was designed to rigorously evaluate the effect of buprenorphine and methadone on NAS. So there are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, one of them, importantly, is what is the best induction procedure for pregnant women on buprenorphine? This, stu this study did not answer that. In fact, it raised some questions about it. Um, we also use sub Subutex, um, so we don't have any data on the safety and efficacy of Suboxone exposure during pregnancy. And again, very importantly, this was a very rigorous trial so that um, these infants, mothers did not use alcohol, they didn't use benzodiazepines, and these are two drugs that have a very significant impact on NAS and the management of NAS so that we don't know what's going to happen if these differences with buprenorphine are going to be maintained uh, when it's um, confounded with alcohol and benzodiazepine exposure. So now let's uh, go to illicit drug and prescription misuse, talk about that briefly. Uh, Carol, this is Kathleen, um, real quick before you move on to that. Um, we had a question that came in about um, what about the impact of cigarette smoking on methadone and or bu uh, buprenorphine dose? Cigarette smoking uh, impacts NAS, whether the mother is being maintained on methadone or buprenorphine. That doesn't matter. Um, but cigarette smoking does impact on not whether the infant will have to be treated for NAS, but it does impact on the length of treatment. Okay. Okay, we also had another question that, that just came in. Um, why would a pregnant woman be prescribed, be prescribed Subutex versus Suboxone? Is one better than the other for pregnant patients? Subutex and Suboxone are exactly the same in terms of buprenorphine. Um, but Suboxone has naloxone added to it in order to control for diversion. The naloxone has no effect at all when it's taken sublingually, so it becomes like a, a placebo part of the drug, except that they try to abuse it by crushing it up and injecting it. So in terms of the medication, there's no difference in the buprenorphine. The reason that we use Subutex and the reason that Subutex is recommended for pregnant women is because there are no data on the effect of naloxone on the fetus. And so that's the reason for the, the guidelines that recommend that pregnant women be maintained on Subutex. Um, it's just a conservative approach since we have no data on, on naloxone and fetal development. 
Great. Thank you, Carol. What's also important to remember is that methadone or buprenorphine has no direct pharmacological effect on non-opioids. So if you have a woman in treatment who's using, abusing alcohol, who's abusing cocaine, the fact that she's being maintained on methadone or buprenorphine is not going to impact her use of those drugs. It has to be treated as a clinically a separate problem, and that's why it's so important that you have ex comprehensive treatment services uh, that can clinically address the use of other medications. As I mentioned earlier, benzodiazepine misuse is the most difficult problem of all. Uh, it's very difficult to control, and it does have a significant impact on the length of treatment for NAS, um, for both methadone and buprenorphine. Um, well, at least methadone we have the data for. We don't have the data for buprenorphine, but we assume that it's also going to have an impact on the length of stay for, for buprenorphine. Um, and it's a very difficult problem to treat because, uh, as we'll talk about now, women have a high prevalence of anxiety disorders and they've been prescribed benzodiazepine for a long period of time and then have come to abuse them. So I want to quickly also talk about co-occurring psychiatric disorders because this is something that's extremely prevalent in this population. The prevalence of depression is very, very high. For non-abusing pregnant women, it's reported between 9 and 16 percent. But for women with substance use disorders, it's between 40 to 70 percent. So it's an extremely high um, co-occurring morbidity in this population. We do have some data on that. The Center for Substance Abuse Treatment funded 50 programs in the mid-1990s. They were residential treat programs for women and children, uh, and they were pregnant and postpartum programs, and they published their evaluation results. They had over 5,000 women who received services in this initiative, and 50% of them had mental health disorders. Um, so again, it's extremely high. There's another publication that I just referenced for you that was published in 2007 um, that looked at 106 opioid-dependent pregnant women, and 37% had a primary mood disorder, and of those, a high percentage of them also had an anxiety disorder. Conversely, 36% uh, had a primary anxiety disorder, and of those, they also had a concomitant mood disorder. So this is something that's extremely present present, and it raises the question about what to do with treatment, because um, SSRIs, which are um, uh, serotonin uh, receptor inhibitors, selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, that's the most widely prescribed antidepressant medication in the country. Uh, but in recent years, there's been uh, reports describing neonatal complications uh, associated with SSRIs. Uh, especially cardiac uh, malformations, and in 2004, the U.S. FDA required warnings on these perinatal complications. Physicians were advised to taper their dose during the last trimester so that the fetus was not exposed to it at least seven to ten days before delivery. Um, so that's, that's uh, raised some concerns. There's also concerns about that it may uh, cause a type of abstinence syndrome. Um, it's been referred to as a poor neonatal adaptation rather than an abstinence syndrome, but it has a lot of the same um, symptoms as neonatal abstinence syndrome. So there's been some concern about that, whether um, SSRIs cause a withdrawal or uh, just a serotonin toxicity. Um, but we need to make sure that we don't confuse them and we need to uh, not confuse um, what may be um, SSRI symptoms with NAS symptoms. Um, but we need to remember that the number of data are quite small, the number of studies are small. Um, the occurrence of any kind of an abstinence syndrome is, is no higher than 30 percent. Um, Paxil and Prozac are the SSRIs most commonly reported with um, this, uh, these abstinence-type syndromes, but it may, be it may be related to the pharmacology or it may be the fact that they are the most widely used. Also, I just want to mention that um, 
in, in response to the FDA call, that there also was an, an article, a study that was conducted and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. And they um, looked at uh, and found that um, paroxetine, Paxil, and Zoloft had the most common associations with any kind of congenital anomalies. Not, they weren't looking at an abstinence syndrome, but they were looking at the incidence of, of uh, uh, congenital heart anomalies and some bowel anomalies. Um, some um, <clears throat> abdominal wall defects, and they found that the most most were associated with these two medications. But even then, the association was extremely rare. Um, so again, you have to look at the risk uh, of untreated disease with the benefit of avoiding a, a rare um, complication, uh, because we know that untreated depression is extremely risky. Um, you have uh, suicidal ideation, you have hypertension, you have a lot of prenatal problems with low birth weight, preterm birth, spontaneous abortion. These are all associated with untreated depression. Um, so that you have to make, again, a value judgment of do you want to have um, the risk of all of these problems or um, do you want to treat the woman knowing that you may have a very small risk of a problem associated with the medication? Um, so again, it comes back to looking at a risk-benefit model. In terms of breastfeeding, and this is a question that always comes up, can mothers who are maintained on methadone or maintained on buprenorphine, may they breastfeed? Uh, and opioid-maintained mothers can breastfeed uh, if they are not HIV positive, if they are not using illicit drugs, and if they do not have a disease or an infection in which breastfeeding is contraindicated. Uh, so this is for both uh, methadone and buprenorphine uh, medication. Um, we have a history of recommendations uh, regarding methadone. Uh, for a long time, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, supported it, but recommended that women be on no more than 20 milligrams of methadone, which was an absurd recommendation because that's not a therapeutic dose. In 2001, they eliminated the dose restriction uh, on methadone, making methadone uh, maintenance compatible with re breastfeeding regardless of dose, and the publications that we have that have looked at the amount of methadone in breast milk, uh, they don't find any relationship with higher doses. Um, we have limited evidence with buprenorphine, uh, but the evidence indicates that only small amounts of buprenorphine pass into breast milk. Uh, so the consensus panels that look both at medication-assisted treatment and look specifically at buprenorphine, both of them recommended uh, that buprenorphine can be, uh, that mothers who are maintained on buprenorphine can breastfeed. So in terms of medication-assisted treatment, it's the most effective when it's provided in appropriate doses. So going back to uh, one of the initial issues that we started with, dose should never be controlled or minimized uh, to avoid NAS or because of, of uh, uh, protective custody issues or placement of the child. Uh, the mother needs to have this is a medication, and the mother needs to be provided with what would be a therapeutic dose. It needs to be provided in the context of prenatal care. Treatment for pregnant women who are receiving medication-assisted treatment has been shown to be extremely effective in reducing both neonatal, um, prenatal and neonatal out, um, problems and having positive outcomes for babies but it has to be done within the context of comprehensive care. You have to be providing prenatal care. It's not the medication that is, you know, doing it all. Obviously, it's helping because the fetus is not subjected to stress of withdrawal, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You have to have comprehensive care where you're able to provide prenatal care, you're able to improve nutrition, you're able to stabilize the woman's home environment, able to get her into treatment where she can begin a road to 
uh, recovery from her uh, substance use disorder. And it's best when it's provided as part of a woman-centered treatment. That does not mean it has to be a specialty program for women only, but it means that the treatment has to be women-centered, that it has to focus on the needs of women, understand their needs, uh, and understand the risks that they bring to all of the complexities that they bring to treatment. So I guess, you know, the the take-home message is that medication-assisted treatment has to be evaluated within a risk-benefit model, but that even when you do that, it needs to take into account what is best for both the mother and child. And I'll use the example of the findings from the mother study. There's a lot of emphasis now on the fact that the, if the mother is maintained on buprenorphine, that the NAS for the baby may be much, much less, uh, which is certainly an extremely positive thing. Uh, and so if you have a mother that can be effectively managed on either methadone or buprenorphine, buprenorphine would certainly be the medication of choice. However, buprenorphine is not appropriate and not effective for all women. So it doesn't make any clinical sense to mandate that a woman be on buprenorphine when she's pregnant if that's not going to be the effective medication for her. And we need to understand that there are going to be, there's a, a group of women that are going to require methadone uh, in order to be effectively treated during pregnancy. We also need treatment programs that have to better understand the complex needs of opioid dependent women and employ models of care that address their multiple issues because this is a very complex population. We haven't had time to talk about all of the issues that they bring to treatment, all of their biopsychosocial um, histories, uh, but this is a, a, you know, just looking at their psychiatric comorbidities, you know that this is a very vulnerable population, but we also have a, a population of women that have a high history of, of, of um, physical and sexual abuse, of being, uh, you know, having intimate uh, partner violence uh, histories, uh, and so they, they need a lot of support and a lot of services if they're going to be able to uh, effectively engage in recovery. So I think that that's the end of, of uh, what I want to talk about. Uh, and I guess the next step is to go to uh, Kathleen or um, are we going to take some more questions now? Okay, one question. Um, what is neonatal serum? Pardon me? Neonatal serum? Uh, I don't know. I've never heard that term. Uh, you know, you take the serum blood levels uh, to see the amount of a medication, a drug in, that's in the blood system. Um, there's um, tincture of opium, which is a medication used to treat neonatal abstinence, uh, but I've never heard of the term neonatal serum. Okay, for, for that individual who um, submitted that question, if you have any additional context or explanation um, that you would like Dr. Kaltenbach to address, please feel free to submit some additional, um, additional sub-questions to that. Uh, next question that came in is, some babies, should babies exposed to SSRIs in utero be scored using the Finnegan NAS tool? No, it wasn't designed to score um, SSRIs, and a lot of the symptoms of SSRIs are um, the reverse of the opioid abstinence symptoms. Um, SSRIs, it's, it's, it's been pretty much agreed that they don't go through withdrawal, that you see some of these behaviors that are similar to some symptoms in withdrawal, but it's not really a withdrawal. It doesn't need a treatment. Um, and so for an infant that has not been exposed to opioids uh, but is having some of these behaviors because the mother has been on SSRIs, um, the infant is usually not going to be treated for that, so it wouldn't need to be scored for that. But it's certainly important to observe those behaviors and uh, be able to determine that they're um, probably related to the SSRI exposure and not to some other disease condition. Uh, for infants that mothers are maintained on uh, either buprenorphine or methadone 
and who are also taking SSRIs. Uh, that's important for the uh, treatment staff at the hospital to know because it may well, in fact, influence the length of NAS treatment. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, next question is, what is your advice for mothers who are smoking marijuana and want to breastfeed? That they shouldn't breastfeed. I mean, the recommendation that has always been out there is that any use of illicit substances, and marijuana is an illicit substance. Um, so I don't know of anybody who recommends the use of breastfeeding um, if the mother continues to use illicit substances. In the same manner, if a woman is maintained on methadone but continues to use some co cocaine or continues to use heroin, uh, she would not be permitted uh, to breastfeed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, can a breastfeeding mom take Suboxone? Does the naloxone pass through the breast milk? Um, I can't answer that definitively. I can just tell you what the, the recommendations are that women can breastfeed if they're taking buprenorphine, if they meet those criteria that they're not using any other illegal drugs and have HIV, and if they meet those criteria. The problem is the recommendation is that if women are to be maintained on buprenorphine that they take Subutex. Um, that being said, we know that a lot of women are maintained on, on Suboxone, which contains the um, naloxone. The issue with naloxone um, when it's taken sublingually is that very little of it gets into the bloodstream. So there shouldn't be much in, if any, in the breast milk, but we don't have any data on that. Um, I don't know of, of any, any data that's looked at, at Suboxone. Uh, we, as I said, we only have a few studies, and that have, that's looked at, at pure buprenorphine, Subutex, in, in breast milk. But theoretically, there shouldn't be, um, very, there shouldn't be uh, much, if any, Suboxone, I mean, um, naloxone in the breast milk. Um, that's the same question that comes up sometimes. Uh, physicians will say, well, why isn't it all right for pregnant women to take Suboxone? Because if they're taking Suboxone, very little of the um, naloxone gets into the bloodstream. That's why they're able to take it. And the answer is yes, very, very little gets into the bloodstream, but we don't know how much gets into the bloodstream. And again, because we don't have any studies on fetal development and naloxone, uh, it's recommended that the safer course is to take Subutex. So um, it would be to breastfeed and take Suboxone is just going to be a, a, a you know again a personal decision. There aren't any recommendations on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question: What do you mean by there are some women who are on methadone who should not be on buprenorphine? What would disqualify a mother to switch to buprenorphine? There's nothing that would disqualify her, but it, buprenorphine may not be the most effective medication for her. Buprenorphine is a mixed agonist, whereas methadone is a full new agonist. So methadone has, um, a, does not have a threshold. Um, you can, if, if 80 milligrams doesn't work, you can increase it to 90 milligrams. If 90 milligrams doesn't work, you can increase it to 100 milligrams. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist, so it doesn't have the same properties, and it has a threshold effect, meaning that when you get to, right now, that the cutoff is 32 milligrams, although there are some people that will say it really should be 22 to 24 milligrams, where you've reached a ceiling effect, where no matter how much you increase the dose, you're not going to get any more effect from the medication. So that even though we don't have a lot of data on it, the the assumption is that people that have very long-term chronic histories of opioid dependence that require very high doses of methadone, say they require 200 milligrams a day to be effectively maintained, that the buprenorphine medication is not going to be effective because 32 milligrams of buprenorphine is roughly equivalent to 140 milligrams of methadone. Next, next question. 
um, can you talk for a minute about what treatment programs should do if they have a pregnant woman on medication-assisted treatment before she delivers so that the baby isn't removed by child welfare upon delivery? Thank you. I think that's a very, very important question. Um, there's a lot that she can do. There's a lot that the hospital can do. Um, and part of it depends on the history of the program and how much experience they have with pregnant women. Um, I'll use our program as an example, not to tout our program, but just, you know, to sort of identify it as a model because we specialize in the treatment of pregnant opioid dependent women. So we're well known in the city. The hospital at Jefferson is known as the place to go if you're opioid dependent and pregnant. That, as that's the case, we also have a very strong relationship with the Department of Human Services in town. And they know that if a woman is receiving treatment at our program, that she's receiving extensive treatment. She's just not going in and getting uh, a medication and, and not much else. Um, so we have a working relationship with them. Um, we also work very hard, and of course we obviously have a, a relationship with the hospital, so that our nurse coordinator is involved in all of the deliveries and in the treatment of the, the neonates in the hospital. What we do with the women is that we give them a lot of support and help them understand what neonatal abstinence is. Um, you know, they feel very guilty that their child is going to go through withdrawal. We try to educate them about what the symptoms are, what to expect. We um, show them the scoring tool that's used to determine whether the baby will be treated or not so that they understand it, so that they do not think it's a capricious, you know, judgment on the part of a nurse or a physician. Um, we talk about what's going to happen if the baby has to be treated um, and how she's probably going to be discharged ahead of the baby. The baby will have to stay in the hospital. We talk about how important it is for her to come in and visit the baby. We help educate about the uh, behavior that's expected in the hospital uh, if her baby's being treated. Um, we talk about the symptoms and especially like sleep, how hard it is uh, when the baby's first being treated to establish a normal sleeping pattern. And so she doesn't want to, you know, go in to see the baby and think, oh, I'm here, I'm going to wake my baby up and hold him. You know, that, that's extremely uh, disruptive and, and harmful for her baby. So we try to educate her on all the things to expect and understand uh, and uh, familiarize her with the hospital, where her baby is going to be, um, help her to understand that um, even though her baby is going to go through withdrawal, um, that it can, the baby will be treated and will be comfortable. Um, again, help her to understand that there's no um, relationship between what her dose is and whether her baby is going to have to be treated or not. And also especially help her to understand that she's moving forward, that she's coming to treatment, that what she's been doing and is doing is for the healthy outcome of her baby and try to, you know, put it in a positive uh, frame so that she sees how important and how positive steps she's been taking uh, rather than feeling you know, guilty and uh, upset about what's going on. Thank you. One last question before we move towards wrap-up, um, sort of related. How do we consider relapse in medication-assisted treatment when child welfare has to maintain the ASPA timeline, and the ASPA timeline being 12 months to a permanent plan um, or six months in the case of, of very young children? Uh, relapse is an important issue. Um, I think the the issue is that, you know, women can often come into treatment when they're pregnant. They're actively using, you get them into treatment. Um, they're not necessarily going to stop using overnight. Um, they, you know, it may take them a while to get on an appropriate dose. It may take them a while to eliminate their active drug use. Where that is in her pregnancy depends on when she comes into treatment during her pregnancy. Um, certainly, if she's active, still actively using at the time of delivery, um, Child Protective Services are involved. Uh, and uh, it may be that she's made enough progress in treatment that she can still uh, maintain custody even though there's an, you know, an open file. Uh, but as long as, as progress 
goes forward, uh, there's an endpoint. If if she's not engaged in treatment and not making progress in treatment, then uh, you know the relapse is going to be an issue, and she's going to be at risk for losing her child. But I think most most child welfare departments who are in areas that have very active treatment programs for pregnant women have have worked a, out a relationship where they understand issues. Uh, a lot better and understand uh, what the treatment program is trying to do and have, have worked out a supportive relationship, a, a mutual relationship that where they each can uh, attend to what their mission is in a productive way. That where there's, you know, not, they're not necessarily at, at uh, odds with each other. Thank you, Dr. Carlton Bach. Your, I think, um, information has been valuable and critical and the uh, number of questions and comments that we've gotten throughout the course of this session, I think, reflect the amount of interest and need for this kind of information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move into the next part of our um, session and do some a quick review of some considerations for child welfare policy and practice. And in thinking about considerations for child welfare policy and practice, I want to take a step back and um, look at the needs of, of infants and exposed to methadone or, or buprenorphine or any substance in the context of any infant um, exposed to substances, whether illegal or illicit or um, legal like alcohol and tobacco or prescription drugs. And to look at that in the context of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, um, the 2003 amendments, um, if for those of you who may be familiar with the CAFTA amendments, um, provided in the 2003 amendments that any infant born and identified as affected by illegal substances uh, or withdrawal symptoms re resulting from prenatal drug exposure, the CAPTA amendments indicated that these infants should be um, reported to Child Protective Services, but that this is not to be intended to be a definition of child abuse and neglect or to use that report for any sort of illegal action and that the um, Child Welfare Agency is to develop a plan of safe care for these infants. And then recently in the 2010 reauthorization of CAPTA, they added um, the addressing the needs of infants born with and identified as being affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder um, and including the appropriate referrals to, ch referral to child protective services systems or, and for other appropriate services as well. So states who receive um, CAPTA funding are required to provide assurances that those um, identification and reporting processes are in place. And so in considering overall child welfare policy and practice with respect to infants um, born exposed to methadone or, or any other medication assist, uh, through medication-assisted treatment of the, of the mother, that we want to put these in the context of any infant who is exposed to substances and look at the overall child welfare policy and practice in responding to infants in general. Um, it's not a, um, not necessarily looking at one particular substance or pulling out one particular substance, but looking at the overall screening assessment and referral to service process that occurs in the Child Welfare Agency and in connecting infants and their families to needed services. Part of that policy and procedure includes looking at um, the multiple stakeholders that are involved. Obviously, um, if you have a woman who is on medication-assisted treatment, then coordinating with the substance abuse treatment providers and if she's involved with the courts, to be coordinating with the courts is essential. And I think, um, Carol, you indicated in, in some of your comments in response to the questions about um, ensuring that the Child Welfare Agency is involved so that way there is some communication that happens back and forth about the woman's status in her treatment program, the type of medication-assisted treatment that she's receiving, and um, the communication that needs to happen between the treatment provider and the child welfare system to make sure that, um, if at all possible, the family can remain um, intact and that she can be supported through her treatment program along with her child um, and being supported through the child welfare system as well. And that relates to identifying what kind of information needs to be released between those agencies, that there is obviously um, the, need for, the need for communication to go back and forth between agencies, and the more specific you can be about what kind of information is intended to be um, released between agencies and, and how and when that information needs to go um, to ensure that 
agencies and the parents are aware of uh, what information is being shared so that the providers, the child welfare agency, and potentially the courts are um, all mutually informed of, again, the status of the woman in her um, treatment and the medications that she's receiving and how that is impacting the, the safety of her child. And that it's not necessarily about the one particular type of medication that she's receiving, but again, about the overall safety of the child and looking at the safety of the child in the context of the overall family, not just in with respect to any one particular um, substance or medication. Um, this also goes to looking at role clarification, um, again, in terms of identifying the kind of information that needs to be shared between the child welfare agency, the, the um, substance abuse treatment providers, and the courts, identifying what sort of role each plays in supporting the infant, in identifying needed services and making referrals for services for both the infant and the, the, the um, family. And then, obviously, the more clarification that can be provided in written policies and guidelines for clients and staff is important. We have a publication that's available through the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, Substance Exposed Infant State Responses to the Problem. Um, where we provide a overview of nine states and their um, programs that are in place to address the needs of substance exposed infants and their families. This monograph lays out a framework for identifying the needs of substance exposed infants across a variety of time frames from both pre-pregnancy um, to the prenatal period to the time of birth um, and then at immediately following birth for infants and toddlers, and then later in life as, as school ch school age children and adolescents. And I guess, again, the overall message that, that we convey through this document and in our others about substance exposure during um, pregnancy is that for, um, preg for during the pregnancy period, as well as for infants and toddlers, screening is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing process for screening infants and children for their developmental and, and other needs that may be related to their exposure to substances, and that it's an ongoing process for identifying and referring them and their families for services. Another resource that's available to you through the Guttmacher Institute, um, State Policies in Brief Substance Abuse During Pregnancy. Um, the Guttmacher Institute provides an overview of state um, statutes um, for use during pregnancy, um, in response to use during pregnancy, and um, the kinds of, of laws that are in place in a variety of states. So um, if you look up the Guttmacher Institute, you can take a look at your own individual state and find out what are some of the laws in place regarding prenatal substance use um, in your state. And then finally, as we're nearing the end of our time together today, um, one of um, notify you of our um, upcoming conference, Putting the Pieces Together for Children and Families, the National Conference on Substance Abuse, Child Welfare, and the Courts. It will be held on September 14th through September 16th at the Gaylord National Resort and Convention Center on the Potomac in National Harbor, Maryland. It is featuring the um, eighth annual gathering of the National Alliance for Drug and Danger Children. And this conference will highlight um, some, many of the issues that we've discussed today, medication assisted treatment, the needs of um, infants prenatally exposed to substances, as well as um, services, practices, and policies for prenatal substance use, and um, as well as a variety of other critical issues facing um, the work that all of you do every day with the children and families that you work with, from um, family drug courts, drug testing, um, military families, cost offset, cost savings, um, we have a variety of workshop and plenary sessions that will be highlighting some of those critical issues. And um, you have here in your packet in your handout the link to get information on this conference. And um, feel free to, um, to uh, call us if you have any questions, but registration is open now. And um, in wrapping up for today, ending right on time, we'd like you, as you close out of your webinar session, you will be prompted to complete an evaluation. Um, that evaluation is a very brief uh, eight questions. Just uh, give us some feedback. We welcome your feedback, and we certainly use it to enhance the programming that we provide on these webinar sessions. So in summary, just want to thank everyone for the time today, and I hope that you found this presentation 
um, informative and useful. And again, I want to um, sincerely thank Dr. Kaltenbach for her time and effort in putting this presentation together and for um, spending this time with us today. So thank you again, Dr. Kaltenbach. Could I just make a statement about um, the disclosure of information, the communication that you were talking about? Absolutely. Um, because it's important to understand that although um, both systems should and need to collaborate and communicate, it needs to be understood that treatment programs um, are extremely restricted as to what information can be released um, under the federal regulations of uh, Drug Treatment Confidentiality Act. Um, and that often is misunderstood um, by child welfare agencies because obviously we're all on the same, want the same thing. But um, treatment programs um, are not permitted to provide any disclosure of information without the client's consent. Um, and it's extremely limited as to what information they can disclose. Um, so that um, that needs to be understood and uh, respected. Obviously, there are ways that you know you can sort of um, convey information without disclosing information. But um, you know, it's you can't just call up a treatment program and say um, you're we have your you know patient in uh, we're making a determination as to whether we should take her child or she should be reunified and we need to have uh, X, Y, and Z information regarding her drug use and her history. It can't be given. Thank you. I think uh, that, that point is what leads to quite a bit of frustration and miscommunication between child welfare and treatment providers in um, attempting to gather the kind of information that's needed to make appropriate determinations about the um, permanency of the child while at the same time um, protecting the, the rights and confidentiality of the parent that's in the treatment program, which um, points to the need for the, the on the agency level for there to be a, a very in-depth conversation that needs to happen between the child welfare agencies and the treatment providers about what kind of information is to be shared, how that information will be shared, and how the appropriate releases of information will be ensured so that, again, the child welfare agency has the information they need to be able to make appropriate determinations and at the same time protecting the, the confidentiality of the, of the um, parents in their treatment program. And that those kinds of conversations are, are long and in-depth and, and difficult, um, but that the, on, on the, on the ultimate end goal of improving outcomes for children and families and keeping families intact, the, those conversations need to happen um, in order to be able to, to identify what they as a collaborative can do for families. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you all for your time today. And um, if you, I think we had another question that came in about um, getting a, a copy of the PowerPoints and handouts. Um, those are available on the Children and Family Futures website that is provided in your um, packet of, um, in the PowerPoint slide. Um, again, you can feel free to contact um, any of us or visit our National Center website for additional information. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all again uh, for participating. Fill out the evaluation as you log off today. And um, thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.